Hi, I'm Zeke with the Eastside Church of Christ in Baytown, Texas. Thanks for being with us today as we look at another lesson in our series concerning our congregational theme for 2021, Light the Fire. It comes from Luke 24, verse 32, where a couple of disciples were thinking about their visit with Jesus that day and saying, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? You know, that visit with Jesus that day helped revive them. It gave them the boost that they needed from the, dis the, the, the discouragement and the depression that they were in because they thought that Jesus was dead, never to rise again. But when they saw the resurrected Jesus, they knew that there was still work to do. We're going to look today at how you and I can be revived. And we're going to look at resur resurrection to show just how it's so. And so let's begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, it's a, it, it's a well-known chapter on resurrection, but we're going to begin with just the very last nine verses. We're going to start in 1 Corinthians 50 and uh, read all the way through 58. It says, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. And when this perishable shall have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. The idea of resurrection, Christ's and ours, is one of the most important concepts that you and I can ponder. And, and Paul devotes 58 verses of it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he devotes 58 verses to it as he talks about the, the wondrous resurrection of Christians that's based on the resurrection of of Jesus. And certainly he ties the importance of our resurrection to Christ's resurrection. In chapter 15, Paul has already shown the, the pattern of resurrection. In verse 20, he says, Now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who were asleep. In verse 23, each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, after that, those who were Christ's at his coming, and then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. He tells us about the, the power of resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. In verse 42, he says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. When he's talking about how different entities uh, have different bodies, he calls them. He says, it is sown a, a perishable body, it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. So he tells us that not only are we going to be changed, he told us that in, in the passage that we read, but the power of resurrection lies in that change in how we're going to be utterly and completely different. Which leads me to the revival, which is in resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus is the single most life-impacting event in history. You might think that's a big statement. Think about it. The ramifications of this one single event are not only momentous in this life, but they are eternal. 
It is eternally important. And so how we view the resurrection can make the difference between a revival of sorts in this life or resignation to death. So let's talk for a moment about Jesus' own resurrection, about his own revival. And we're going to go to Mark chapter 16 to do this. Mark 16 tells us the story of Jesus' burial and the discovery of the tomb that was supposed to contain his body. In Mark chapter 16, in verse 1, it says, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. Then they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And they said, he said to them, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He is risen. He's not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, He's going ahead of you to Galilee, and there you will see him, just as he told you. Now, we know about the story of Jesus' death. Condemned as a criminal, sentenced to die a criminal's death, Jesus was all but forgotten by his enemies. Now, they had placed a, a guard around his tomb, but it wasn't to prevent Jesus from rising from the dead. It was because they were afraid that his disciples would steal the body and say that he had risen from the dead. After all, if he's dead, why worry about his outlandish claims? But this angel appears in an empty tomb and says, Jesus is not here. He's risen. Now go and you'll see him. And not only that, he says, just as he said to meet him in Galilee, go do that. His resurrection, Christ's, would be the vindication of all the claims in the most emphatic way possible. For instance, it fulfilled his own prophecy in John chapter 2. In John chapter 2, towards the beginning of, of his ministry, Jesus had caused a ruckus by driving out money changers and businessmen, conducting business in the temple. And in verse 18, the Jews said, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Who gave you the right to do this, they want to know. This is Jesus' answer. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, it took 46 years to build this temple. In fact, in Jesus' time, construction was still going on. It would take, it, it, it would take more years to complete the temple, yet says, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you'll raise it up in three days? But it says in verse 21 that he was speaking of the temple of his body. And three days after Jesus was put in the tomb, that's exactly what he did. He raised the temple of his body. Jesus fulfilled his own prophecy. Of course, it was predicted by the prophets themselves and in Luke chapter 24 just take a, a quick left there in Luke 24 and in verse 46 after Jesus has written had had arisen he wanted his disciples to know that this is just the way it was supposed to be he said to them in verse 46 thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day in fact, no less than three times, Jesus told his disciples that on their way to Jerusalem, he was going to be mistreated. He was going to be abused. He was going to suffer. He was going to die. But he always mentioned that he would rise again. And certainly, true to his word, he did. But it wasn't only his prophecy fulfilled that vindicated his claims. It was also his power 
displayed in John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, Jesus talks about this very thing. In John 10 and in verse 17, in John 10 and in verse 17, Jesus said, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life. Why? So that I may take it up again. No one has taken it from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. And I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. So although we usually consider, well, it was the Jews that killed Jesus. It was the Romans that killed Jesus. Jesus says, no, I'm laying my own life down. I'm doing it voluntarily. And it's completely within my power, he said, to raise it up again. I'll lay it down. I'll take it up. We not only see his prophecy fulfilled and his power displayed, but his revival, his resurrection, was the ultimate declaration of his deity. In Romans chapter 1, in Romans 1, as Paul opens that letter, he talks about the promise in verse 2 that was given beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, but who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, yes, Jesus is David's son, Jesus is David's descendant, but he is God's son. And this was driven home, Paul said, by the fact of Jesus' resurrection. And he says, all of it was promised beforehand through his prophets in the scriptures. Jesus' resurrection not only vindicated the facts of his identity, but also certified the work that he came to do on our behalf. And without, without his resurrection, Jesus is simply just another good teacher. If Jesus is still dead, the ramifications from his never being risen again are huge. He would not be who he said he was. He would just he would be a deluded lunatic who didn't know reality from anything else. But we know different. Let's consider for a moment the apostles' revival. In John chapter 20, we find them after Jesus' crucifixion in a very precarious situation. They had not known yet that Jesus had risen from the dead. And they were just beside themselves with grief, confusion, frustration. They didn't know what they were going to do. It says in John 20, in verse 19, that when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Now we'll stop there for a moment. By this point already, the disciples had seen the empty tomb. They knew Jesus wasn't there. They didn't know where he was. They knew that some of, some of the women had mentioned his rising again, but they hadn't seen him. And besides, what about the Jews who had made sure that Jesus would be crucified? What if, what if we're next? they might be thinking. No wonder in verse 19 it tells us that they were shut up behind closed doors for fear of, of the Jews. If you remember, during Jesus' arrest, the apostles all fled. They all ran away. And Peter denied him during his subsequent illegal trials, not once, but three times. And at his crucifixion, their dreams were shattered. Their hopes were dashed. Their confidence was crushed. They huddled behind locked doors because they thought that they were going to be next. But the turning point came when they saw the living, resurrected Jesus. Look at verse 21. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. And that's exactly what they needed. And from this point on, we see a distinctly, decidedly different 
group of men. For instance, where here we see them cowardly cowering behind closed doors. Instead, we see them now as courageous and confident men. In Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 2, as Peter gives that famous first sermon on Pentecost, he reminds them of who they are and what they're about. They were accused of being drunk because they were speaking in languages that they hadn't studied before. And in verse 14, it says that Peter took his stand with the eleven. Remember before they had all run away when Jesus was being arrested? Now they're taking a firm stand for Jesus together. He raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. We go a little further down to verse 22. He says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to, to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again since it was impossible for him to be held in the power of death. He goes on to say in verse 24, that since he was raised up again, all of this was in fulfillment of Scripture, and he gives us the passage in verses 25 to 28. But look at verse 29. He says, Brethren, I confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. But not Jesus. Verse 32. Jesus, God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. They were utterly confident of the fact that Jesus had arisen and that gave them the boldness that they needed to preach to others, even the very ones who who only weeks before were screaming, crucify him, crucify him. Not only were they confident, but certainly, of course, they were courageous. In Acts chapter 4, in Acts chapter 4, in verses 7 through 12, Peter and John had been arrested by probably the very same religious leaders who had railroaded Jesus into a criminal's death. And it says in verse 7, when they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire of them, by what power and what name have you done this? Remember, they asked the same thing of Jesus. Who gave you the right to do what you're doing? Well, that's what they want to know of Peter and John. And it says in verse 8 that Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we're on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. They want to know by whose authority are you doing this? He's telling them by the name of Jesus, in the authority of Jesus, this has been done. And don't forget, <laughs> for good measure, he tells them, Jesus is the one that you killed. Jesus is the one that you crucified. In fact, he says later on in chapter 5 and verse 29, we must obey God rather than men. And they're willing to do just that. In fact, secular history, or at least tradition, regarding the apostles tells us that each one suffered mightily for the message that they that they preached. Each one of them suffered not just persecution, but bodily harm. And each one suffered a martyr's death. Except for John, they tried to kill him apparently, but he survived. He died an outcast on the island of Patmos apparently. But each one of them, because of the confident, courageous manner 
in which they now lived in the revival of the resurrection caused them to be completely different men. Why? Because they'd seen the risen Christ. Well, what about your revival? In Romans chapter 6, Paul tells us that we experience a revival of sorts in this life that is directly connected to the resurrection of Jesus. In Romans 6, in verse 3, Paul says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Now, we'll stop there for just a moment. Remember what Jesus said in John 10? I lay it down. No one takes it from me. I lay it down. But then he said, so that I may take it up again. So when we think of Jesus' death, we shouldn't just think of his death and his burial. We need to connect that with his resurrection. For if Jesus had not died and been buried, he could not have been resurrected. Verse 4, Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, because death is no longer master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, that's a lot. But I want us to see a couple of things. One, of course, is the reenactment of the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus in baptism. And it's easy to see that, how that's done. We were dead in sin, estranged from God. We were buried in baptism. And then we were raised, Paul tells us here, to walk in newness of life. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 that we are new creatures now. The old has passed away. The new things have come. And there are new things. There's a new perspective. There's a new direction for our lives. And with that new direction, there's a new destiny where we'll end up. All of that means that now, finally, we have freedom. He told us that we've been freed from sin. Look again at verse 12 with me. He says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts, do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Now, Paul says, you're new people now. You don't live like you used to. You don't even think like you used to. Think about that. If you have found your freedom in Christ, I dare say, that you have found a new way to live. And that new way to live probably, hopefully, doesn't resemble the old you. You're somebody different now. And because you think differently about what you want to do in order to be pleasing to the Lord, you have a completely different lifestyle. You don't do the things you used to do. You don't find the same pleasure in them that you used to. You are freed from the things that you were once slave to and now are free to serve God in a way that, that not only honors Him, gives Him glory in this life, but benefits you in this life as you prepare for the next. Once we were among the walking dead, now we are revived people living a resurrected life. And without His revival, our faith would be worthless. We would still be in our sin. Look with me for a moment as we go back near where we began. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul says in verse 16 that if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. Think about it. If there is no resurrection, 
then Jesus is still somewhere in the earth. He's not alive. But then he says, and if that's true, if Christ has not been raised, in verse 17, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. You see, the resurrection of Jesus makes it possible for you and I to be freed from the sins that have enslaved us all our lives. His resurrection is our revival. And it's that resurrection and revival that gives us hope. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 18, Paul says, Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Remember we read this earlier? He reminds us that Jesus has been raised. The first fruits, in other words, there are more that are going to follow. And he tells us about that order. In verse 23, Christ the first fruits, after that, those who were Christ at his coming. Think about it. Yes, you may die unless Jesus comes back first. But that's not going to be the end of your story. Revival and resurrection gives us hope. It gives us the hope that carries us through this life so that we can finally and fully reach eternity. That's God's, that is His whole intention for us is to live eternally with Him in a, a realm and an existence that I don't think we can fully appreciate as long as we're in this body. We have freedom, we have hope, we have resurrection to look forward to. Remember where we started, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 57? Look again at verse 57. Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have a revival in this life freedom from sin, hope for eternity as we wait for our resurrection to be with the Lord forever. Death has taken and taken and taken and its aftermath leaves us hurting but yearning even more for what's to come. And thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. So, what? Here's the so what. The so what is in verse 58. Therefore, because of this, because of revival and resurrection, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. God is not going to forget your service to Him. In fact, you are storing up treasures in heaven as you wait for that final revival, as you wait for that full and final resurrection. And as we experience the revival in this life, based on the resurrection of Jesus, we can live steadfastly, immovably, always abounding in the work of the Lord, enthusiastic, motivated, zealous for the life in Christ that God intends for us. And why wouldn't we? Knowing all that's inherent in the significance of Christ's resurrection. Oh, I hope that if you haven't yet, you will find your revival in this life. You will find your resurrection from walking dead in sin to living fully in Christ. Your future depends on it. And if there's some way that we can help you, we want to. Contact us, eastsidebaytown.org. We'd love to help you find your revival resurrection. Thanks for joining us. God bless you.